Good afternoon. Today is a seminar about uh, science and technology here at the CHE that will be given by Pete Ferwilligen, permanent researcher since uh, 2017 at the National Institute for Nuclear Physics at the Division of Bari. He got uh, the engineering degree in applied physics at the Ghent University in 2007 and the doctoral degree in physics at the Kent University in 2012. He won the national, uh, the postdoctor fellow for the Italian citizens at the uh, INFN in uh, 2012, and also the postdoctor research at the University of Bari three years later. He was a postdoctor fellow for young researcher from 2017 and 2018, and uh, he's the primary investigator for Fast Time MPGD project. As a research activity, he was involved in one detector of the CMS experiment at the LHC and contributed both to the testing and performance measurements of the resistive plate chambers of the CMS as the simulation, construction, and testing of the new gas electron multiplier detectors. He searched for early supersymmetry signatures in the first data of the LHC and was involved in the measurements of the Higgs boson decaying to four leptons through measurements of the muon reconstruction trigger performance. In 2016, he won a research grant to work on test and development of the fast time micro pattern gases detector for which it will be the primary investigation and the project we start. Uh, next year. The title of the seminar is uh, Diamond-like Carbon for the Fast Timing Micropattern Gases Detector. Please. Thank you. So I will talk about the uh, Diamond-like Carbon for Fast Timing MPGD. I'm not a Diamond-like Carbon uh, expert, but I will uh, talk from the user's perspective in which we would like to use uh, DLC uh, for uh, future detector uh, construction. So first let me say two words about uh, micro pattern gases detectors. This is the new uh, uh, line of research of, of gases detectors that uh, evolved from the from the wire detectors that were invented by uh, George Sharpak uh, in the 90s in which uh, the photolithography techniques used for silicon detectors were also applied to gases detectors to uh, reduce the uh, uh, anode and cathode size from the order of, uh, of centimeters in the, in the multiwire proportional chamber to uh, micrometers. So you can see here uh, an anode of, of 10 micrometers that is made through um, photolithographic techniques. Uh, to make this uh, microstep gas chamber, which is, let's say, the, the founding father of the, of the micro pattern gases detectors. Uh, reducing, as such, the uh, electrode sizes, uh, one obtained that these uh, detectors can handle much higher particle rates, uh, about three orders of magnitude more than uh, the, um, the traditional wire based gases detectors. How does those uh, micro pattern gases detectors work? As an example, I give here a an, an, uh, triple and double gem uh, detector in which uh, you want to detect a uh, minimum ionizing particle that enters here the, the detector. Uh, for instance, it's an, uh, a relativistic muon. The relativistic muon ionizes the gas in an area which is called the drift area, which is a couple of millimeters. And these electrons that are liberated in clusters along the track length start to drift in an electric field towards an amplification structure. Here is made the zoom of the amplification structure. This is a uh, 50 micron thick uh, polyamide foil, which uh, industrially is called Capton if it's made from the DuPont factory which is perforated with uh, small holes with a diameter of uh, about 15 micron. As you can see here, this is a uh, plot of the electric field inside the, the detector. If you put an, uh, a potential between the top and the bottom of the, of the foil, you have a very intense electric field inside the hole, which can go up to uh, as high as 50 kilovolt per centimeters on the sides and about 30 kilovolt per centimeters in the center. When the electrons that drift 
uh, from when being liberated from the track and they drift towards these holes. They are sucked into, into these holes because the, the electric field lines, they concentrate into these holes. So all the electrons are guided inside the holes. And inside the holes, we have an electric field that is high enough for gas multiplication. So here you start to create an, an, an electron avalanche and you create a charge cloud. This charge cloud can then be transferred to a second level or even a third level of, uh, of a gas electron multiplier uh, for which uh, if each layer has a uh, multiplication factor of about 20, you get 20 by 20 by 20 and you get a total gain of about 8,000. Uh, a total gain of a couple of thousand of, of electrons is then uh, uh, high enough to be seen by the uh, electronics that picks up the, the signal that is induced on these uh, readout strips that you can see here. So who is using those MPGDs? We have a very big collaboration worldwide, uh, which is called the RD51, the Research and Development uh, Collaboration 51, which is based at, at CERN, which uh, uh, unifies, let's say, all research and development in uh, very different aspects on these, uh, on these detectors. Uh, there are about, these are uh, old uh, numbers, but we are, let's say, more than 500 authors right now from more than 75 institutes and more than 25 countries uh, worldwide. Unfortunately, it's, it's still the, the countries that are dark colored and not the countries that are uh, blue colored. So, I mean, as in all the high energy physics, we still have uh, some, some gaps to, uh, to bridge, to, to bring our technology and to involve people all over the world. Wells is using MPGDs, for instance, I'm coming from the CMS experiment, and this is a picture that is taken about a year ago where uh, we built our first uh, large size gases electron multiplier that will be installed next year in the, in the CMS apparatus as a uh, part of the upgrade of the, of the CMS experiment to measure particles in very harsh uh, background conditions. Now, these MPGDs are, let's say, on the forefront of the gases detector R&D. Many people who are working on, on new gases detection technologies are uh, starting from these uh, MPGD detectors. So what you can see here is, is a typical uh, gem foil. So these, this is a foil made of polyamide with uh, copper clad uh, both on top and below. Five micron of copper on top, five micron of copper below, 50 micron of, uh, of polyamide, which is uh, etched. So we have an, a hole of 50 micrometer diameter. And this in a hexagonal uh, uh, lattice uh, with about 140 micron spacing. So what are the characteristics of, of these devices? They have a very high rate capability, uh, more than 50 megahertz per square centimeter, even going up to 100 megahertz per square centimeter for certain type of detectors. They have a very good special resolution. They can go even down below 50 micron without any problem. Uh, they have a high efficiency, and they can be made in flexible uh, detector structures because this is an, a Capton foil of 50 micron, which can be banded. And um, people here inside the, the room, uh, Tonio and uh, Gianni, they have already made um, a very nice uh, circular uh, detector, which were three uh, concentrical uh, cylinders made of this foil, and that has worked excellently. And they have a time resolution of about 5 to 10 nanoseconds. What is missing, and which we need for future applications, is um, a spark protection and a time resolution in the range of, of 25 picoseconds to one, one nanosecond, because those devices are, let's say, physically limited at that five to 10 nanoseconds uh, time resolution. Uh, so one of the ideas in the field is the idea on which I'm working is the, the fast timing MPGD principle. So let me first explain you how the uh, time resolution of a traditional uh, MPGD uh, detector works, and then I will introduce the idea of the fast timing MPGD. So here you have the muon that is traveling through the, the, the gases uh, volume, which is called the drift volume, and that through the ionization process uh, liberates electrons along that, uh, along that track. Now these, uh, these, this is a Poissonian process, and the distances between the, the clusters and also the distance between the cluster, uh, the nearest cluster and the amplification structure is exponentially distributed. So there can be high uh, fluctuations, let's say, between the closest cluster and the amplification structure. Now, the time resolution of the device comes from uh, the, the arrival, let's say, the, um, the distance between the closest cluster and the amplification structure. So sometimes it can be very close and you have a very fast signal. Sometimes it's much farther away and your, your, uh, your signal uh, uh, has a higher... Um, 
as at a less resolution, let's say. So, for example, for an um, for a uh, typical uh, detector mixture like argon CO2 7030, we have a three kilovolt per centimeter and uh, drift velocity of 70 micrometer per nanosecond. Uh, number of primary ionizations is about two and a half per uh, per millimeter. And then we obtain, if we put this in the in the formula for uh, for the time resolution, about the time resolution of about f five to six uh, nanoseconds. And the distance, for instance, an, an average distance is about uh, 277 micrometers, which gives you a distance, a, a, different, a time difference between those clusters of about four nanoseconds. So the idea is to uh, limit the uh, fluctuations of the closest uh, electron ion pair and the amplification structure par by dividing the amplification, the, uh, the drift volume in several uh, small drift volumes, such that uh, you have uh, many more opportunities to have a very close uh, cluster to the amplification structure, let's say. Um, now, in order not to multiply also the number of readout channels by the by the number of uh, of layers that you put inside your gas volume, we want to have uh, an, an, a resistive structure such that all the signals created in intermediate layers are capacitively coupled into the readout uh, electronics. And in this way, the time resolution uh, could improve with uh, n being the number of layers in which you segmented the, the drift volume. Okay, I'll try to go to the next slide. It seems to be blocked. The Gianluca, can you help me? Can you? Shall I try? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, from this uh, fast timing MPGD, or abbreviated the uh, the the FTM, we uh, we already made uh, some prototypes. And this is how the 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 two layer prototype looks like. So we have. Uh, we have a drift layer of about 250 micron uh, of gas, which is delimited by this uh, spacer that is made from, uh, from cover lay. Um, this keeps the, the, the layers apart, let's say. Then we have the gain layer in which the multiplication happens, which is a 50 micron uh, Kapton layer, which is uh, depicted in yellow. And then, because we cannot use the typical uh, Copper uh, electrodes, but we need a resistive electrode to be in order to be transparent for all the signals. We uh, have used a diamond-like carbon as a resistive coating with a thickness of 10 to uh, 100 nanometers. So, if you then look, this is a simulation of the electric field inside the device. We have a 250 micron high uh, gas volume that we call the drift volume, and here 50 micron uh, deep hole which a diameter here of 50 micron and a diameter here of 70 micron. If we then apply a voltage difference of about 500 volt over the, um, over the, over the foil, we get a very intense uh, electric field here. So, and, and we have an, also an, uh, an electric field here uh, inside the drift volume by putting the drift electrode at uh, 600 volt, for instance. Um, then we guide all the electrons inside the hole where the am amplification happens. So this, this is a picture just to show you what the uh, geometrical specifications of the uh, of the amplification structure are so uh, it gives you an idea of the of the size of the uh, of the detector at the microscopic level the the elementary cell let's say so what are the uh, intrinsic challenges of these of this detector because here we push the limits of the micro pattern detectors in, in several ways it's not only one step but it's several steps so here we need to be able to detect single ionization electrons instead of all the electrons uh, inside the drift volume. As you remember from the, the triple gem detector, for instance, we have three millimeters of, uh, of drift in which we collect all the electrons, which are about uh, 100, so, um, which gives all rise, to, which all contribute to the final signal. So here we would like to, to detect only the first electron we are interested in because that's the electron that gives us the, the timing. 
So that means that actually we're already working at the charge which is reduced by a factor 10 to 30, even maybe up to, yeah, to 30 because we're talking about uh, primary ionization. So we need uh, an, uh, a detection structure, an amplification structure that has very high gain. Uh, a single structure because else the, the detector becomes too complicated and the single structure needs to have a very high gain of the order of 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth, 10 to the fifth. Uh, uh, electrons per incoming electron. Therefore, uh, we need the structure to be also very low with spark and discharge rate, such that, uh, therefore, resistive electrodes actually are the natural solution. And uh, we need also very fast electronics that can process pulses with very low charge of the order of 10 to the fourth electrons with about 1.6 fm to coulomb. And this, unfortunately, does not exist as we speak because typically high gain detectors are used for fast timing on that because the time resolution depends on the is, the, is proportional to the inverse of the signal over noise. So the, the higher the gain your detector is, the higher is the signal over noise uh, and the better is your timing uh, of your detector. So this is something we're working on uh, in the project as well, but I will not discuss during uh, this, uh, this lecture. So what are the characteristics that we need for, for the, the diamond-like carbon? Uh, there are a few uh, things that we need to take into account. Uh, we want the uh, electrodes uh, of the detector to be uh, transparent to the signal, and for this research has been done in the past, so I go back to an old article of uh, Battistoni and uh, Yarochi in which they, did, um, they investigated actually for the first time the use of resistive electrodes for, uh, for streamer tubes. Um, and they simulated and measured that uh, we have an, uh, with resistive materials with an, uh, resistance, a surface resistance over 200, kilometer, 200 kilo ohm per square are nearly 100% 100, 100 uh, transparent. So you see here the turn on, let's say, as a function of the uh, uh, surface resistance of the, of the electrode. And from 200 uh, kilo ohm, uh, we, we start to have 100% uh, transparency. What else is important is the rate capability because uh, if we work with resistive electrodes instead of uh, copper electrodes, we uh, will have an, uh, a voltage drop because of the resistivity of the detector. How does that work? So you, you put your detector on the uh, applied voltage, but then when uh, you have an, uh, uh, an, uh, an amplification inside, you, you create a current inside, uh, and this current multiplied with the, with the resistivity gives you a voltage drop. So if this voltage drop is too high, then uh, your efficiency of your detector goes down because the effective uh, high voltage here is not anymore 500 volt, but maybe is lower to 450, um, which lowers the electric field in this area. Then when a particle travels here and goes in this uh, lower electric field than, than foreseen, the, uh, the avalanche here is smaller and might be below the threshold of the electronics. So, therefore, it's important that this uh, resistance is not too high because the higher the resistivity, the higher this voltage drop is, uh, and uh, the faster you have an, uh, a detector in efficiency. This has been studied also by people who developed uh, RPCs, for instance, here by, by Paolo Fonte, and here you can see that uh, he developed detectors with different uh, resistivity. Uh, the detector with the, with the lowest resistivity has the highest rate capability, which you can see in here in green. Uh, here he has an, uh, a resistivity of uh, 4 times 10 to the 7th ohm centimeters, while uh, the blue curve and the red curve uh, are for detectors which much higher resistivity, and you can see that their, uh, their uh, effective gain, which then translates in efficiency, actually uh, falls down as a function of the uh, particle rate uh, very quickly. So if you want to have a detector that is uh, efficient in high rate environments, such as we need for the high luminosity LHC upgrade or for future colliders, um, then, then you, you better have a low resistivity uh, detector which has a high efficiency uh, for detecting particles at, a, at high rates. Another item that is important with, uh, for resistivity, uh, another uh, detector observable, let's say, that uh, varies with the resistivity of the material that is being used, is this, the charge spread due to the resistivity. So if you have uh, here a micro pattern gases detector and you have an, a resistive foil here, when you have here your, your avalanche created inside your detector, which you're going to pick up here by, by the detectors, if you put a resistive foil here, this charge spreads out 
uh, in the resistive foil, and you pick up the signal on more uh, pickup strips than you uh, would do without this uh, resistive foil. This is um, implemented in, 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 in mathematics, so we can perfectly model this, and this is also what I will show you here. This is a nice work done by, by Dixit. Uh, so here they uh, looked at uh, vertical cosmic muon passing through the, through the detector. The charge spread uh, inside the detector was about 150 micron. Instead, the observed hit pattern was about 10 by 30 uh, millimeters. So you, you, uh, you spread the charge over several orders of magnitude with respect to the original uh, uh, charge density, let's say. Uh, this has the advantage that if you read out on, on several pads, so here you can see this is how the detector was segmented in pads of two millimeter by six millimeter. Uh, you can see that they have nearly a hit pattern of, uh, of five by, uh, by a matrix of, uh, of five by five, uh, uh, which are 25 uh, pads. Uh, if you do a weighting of all the charges that are integrated on, on these strips, you get back to a detector resolution of about 100 micron, which is 5% of the strip width because this, the pads had a width of two millimeter. So this is a pretty impressive. Uh, result, let's say. Uh, this is done for a detector where they had a surface resistivity of uh, 570 kilo ohm per, per square. So you see that with a, with a low surface resistivity as this, you have an, a very high spread out of the, of, of the charge. So it has the advantage that you can obtain an improved position resolution through the, the charge weighting uh, as said, but as a disadvantage, it has also that if you spread out your signal over more uh, pads or readout channels, then the signal might be below threshold for each of the of the of the readout. So in the end, you might not be efficient at uh, at uh, detecting your particle. And furthermore, a larger part of the detector might become inactive inact inactive due to the voltage drop after the passing particle. So let's say instead of having only uh, this active this area, you spread out and and. And the whole uh, area here is for a certain amount of hundreds of, of nanoseconds insensitive to a, a new particle that will uh, pass through, which limits your rate capability, obviously. So here, I was first thinking not to introduce any plots because also Johnny will make a presentation, but it was actually, this is a ver this article is actually too nice not to be, not to be used and mentioned. Uh, this is a study of, uh, of Johnny where it, for his detector that is also using a resistive layer. He made three different detectors with different resistivity. One uh, detector with a resistivity of, sorry, it's not readable from the, from the, from the presentation, about 12 mega ohm per square in green, about 80 mega ohm per square in blue, and about 880 mega ohm per square in, in red. And you can see here that uh, this is a plot of the uh, gain as a function of the particle rate. And you can see the higher the resistivity, the, the faster you have your drop of gain, which then results in a drop of inefficiency. So uh, the lower uh, resistivity detector has a higher, uh, can work up to very high particle rates, let's say. But then this also uh, has implications on the uh, uh, special resolution of the detector, let's say, where uh, you have, um, a, um, let's say, the, here, the special resolution, the lower it is, the better it is. So you have an optimum point here at the detector of 80 mega ohm per uh, square um, because uh, here with the detector of 12 mega ohm per square, you have a very large amount of, of, of clusters which then uh, reduces your, uh, your special resolution. If you then have a look also at the detector efficiency, which is the plot at the right, you see that the, both the detectors of, of about um, almost one giga ohm uh, per square and about 100 uh, mega ohm per square. They have an, uh, a turn on that starts much earlier than the detector which has uh, 12 mega ohm per square. And this is because here you have many signals that are spread over many uh, readout strips and where you remain below threshold such that you do not detect the, uh, the, uh, the pulses because you divide your uh, charge over too many electrodes and you go below, uh, below threshold. So for the FTM, we would like to have the lowest uh, resistivity that allows for a good signal transparency as such to obtain the highest uh, rate capability but without too much uh, uh, spread. And the choice of resistivity is not an easy, uh, is not an 
easy item because it's different for each application and it's always a trade-off between the various effects that are at play. So the rate capability, the charge spread, and the, and the single transparency. So we would like to explore uh, MPGDs with an, uh, surface resistivity, let's say, in the, in the largest way between 100 kilo ohm per square and 1 giga ohm per square, but let's say, let's give it a first try with 100 mega ohm per square, which seems to give a good, uh, good result. Now, which materials can, can we use? Uh, um, the resistive electrodes are very good to reduce the, the sparking on the MPGDs. Or, however, it's not easy to find the right uh, resistive material. So if we look at all the materials that are uh, at hand, then we see that in the zone where we want to, to work on our detector, we have not many uh, materials that are available or they're, let's say, uh, seldom and, and expensive. So. It's something that has been observed also by our colleagues from the, from the RPC detectors because if they could lower their, their backlight resistivity, they could make detectors for much higher particle rates. But note here that we have a logarithmic scale and we have a very big gap between, let's say, 10 to the minus 9th in conductivity and 10 to the minus uh, 3 in conductivity. There is a huge gap and we do not have the materials here to make the detector of our dreams. So. That's where comes in uh, the diamond-like carbon, which is, let's say, an artificially made uh, material. This uh, diamond-like carbon is, uh, is a hard, amorphous uh, carbon film with a very high uh, sp3 uh, uh, concentration uh, over the sp2, which is more uh, graphite-like uh, carbon, let's say. Um, it has been already used in many industries, this, uh, this diamond-like carbon, uh, also for uh, abrasive wear and friction re reduction in engines, hard disks, medical applications, even race cars. Um, and it has very nice characteristics. So if we look at the sheet resistivity, we're about where we want to be. Uh, also, the bulk resistivity is not, uh, not high. It's exactly where we want, to, want it to be. So we would like to use this, uh, this material. So I'll first give some, some um, information about uh, colleagues of us that are working inside the RT51 collaboration on micro pattern detectors, which, um, which are working with industries in-house uh, to produce these uh, DLC uh, uh, films. So the first uh, who started to work on this was uh, our colleague uh, Oki uh, from, uh, from Kobe, and he, has, he found a company in Kyoto. So he started from the traditional resistive material that we used also for the, the production of, of RPCs, where uh, we use carbon black, carbon black uh, loaded paste, and then you create your resistive material by uh, smearing this uh, over an area, and, and, and uh, the mechanism of the resistivity is actually that those carbon black starts to interconnect, and you make an, 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 uh, a conductive uh, road. Then, the, let's say, how these conductive roads are made then actually gives you uh, the resistivity of your, your material. But these carbon black particles, they are much high, yeah, they, have, they are, let's say, not as granular as we like it to be, because for the RPCs it went fine, but if we want to make detectors with, an, uh, with uh, electrodes of the order of micrometer, these, uh, these techniques do not work very well. So, so a new approach that he tried was uh, sputtering. So he sputtered carbon in a diamond-like way uh, with a magnetron sputter. Uh, he was able to produce uh, resistive strips uh, using a uh, liftoff process, which might be also interesting for, for us to, to use. And then uh, he, uh, he started working with this, with this company and uh, he measured the surface resistivity as a function of the, of the thickness of the, um, of the DLC. So, and then you see that with uh, uh, the, the thicker your... Um, your DLC layer is, the lower is the resistivity, mm -hmm. which is uh, logic in a kind of sense. He's from the Atlas collaboration, and here in yellow you see the, the requirement they had for, for their detector, so the, the surface resistivity needed to be below one mega ohm per square, so he needed a very thick layer of, uh, of, of uh, DLC. And this has the advantage that uh, since the deposition rate was very slow, uh, he had about 500 or 600 angstrom per hour, uh, it took a very long time to arrive at thicknesses that were uh, advantages for his, uh, for his detector. So what he, he had an idea and he wanted to introduce uh, nitrogen doping in the, in the DLC. So he, uh, he put also uh, nitrogen gas inside the, the magnetron sputtering uh, setup he had. Um, 
And then uh, if you look at the results that he obtained, then you can see that uh, for the, uh, he arri already arrives at the desired uh, surface resistivity of one gigaohm per square, of one megaohm per square, sorry, uh, at the deposition time of 40 minutes, while before he had to do about three hours to do this in the, in the DLC without the, the nitrogen doping. So once we obtained our, uh, our foils, or once one obtained his foils that is uh, polyimide covered with, uh, with diamond-like carbon, we would like to, uh, to make the, the holes to make the amplifying structure. And this is being done by our colleagues in uh, CERN that have been producing the gem detectors for more than 20 years now. Um, and this is the polyimide etching, etching in, uh, in CERN. So these are the foils that are produced that are covered from one side with uh, DLC and the other side they still have the copper and then we apply the, the etching procedure that was being developed for the gems. So this is let's say the old procedure which is called the double mask procedure in which you etch uh, chemically the, the polyimide both from the top and from the bottom, uh, starting both from the bottom and the top and you get this kind of, uh, of structure, this kind of whole structure, uh, to develop uh, gems for larger areas. For instance, for the CMS detector, they had to uh, modify the uh, production process and they developed the single masking, uh, single mask uh, etching process in which they first put a photolithography cover on top of the, the copper layer. Then they developed the, the copper resist and they remove uh, the photo resist and they remove the copper for which they have now the copper acting as a mask for the etching of the polyimide. Then if you uh, put it in, in a bath with uh, alkali atoms, then they start eating the, the polyimide and you start uh, carving away and you make the holes inside the, the polyimide until you reach the bottom. When you reach the bottom, you remove the copper also from the other side with the photoresist technique and you, you do a, a second smaller etching such that you open up also in a nice way the holes from the, from the bottom. So we are going to use this single mask technique now also to etch the foils which are on one side with DLC and on the other side with uh, the copper. And of course, we, uh, we protect the DLC side by gluing it on, an, on a PCB. And we start the, uh, the etching procedure as with a single mask uh, technique only from the top. This was a well understood process for etching uh, polyimide foils with, uh, with a copper top, but unfortunately became a very delicate process for uh, uh, cap captain foils with, with the DLC on top, as you can see here. So here, this is what we would like to obtain. This is the design. Uh, the design says that we want to have a large area of uh, DLC on top with small holes of about, uh, let's say, 50 micron on top and larger holes at the bottom because this is the structure that gives us the higher uh, gas gain inside the holes. Unfortunately, when we do the test production, we saw that actually the holes on top, instead of being small holes of 50 micron, which would be more or less this size, we had very large holes uh, on the top uh, which was not good because then we do not have uh, a high intense electric field inside the holes. So this was an, uh, a failed production as you can see here because there is almost no DLC that is, uh, that is less left over. So if we, and then we, we put it in a simulation to see what would be the effect on the, on the detector. So this is what it should have looked like and this was what we effectively got. If we then look at the, uh, the gains we can obtain instead of a gain of uh, more than 10 to the third, we have actually a gain of only a few hundred, which is not enough to, uh, we cannot even test our detectors because uh, electron clouds of a, of a few hundred electrons we are not able to, to measure with our uh, amplifiers. So we started, we tried to understand what exactly went, went wrong in the etching process and this was the hypothesis we made. So, so this is the, the starting foil. We have uh, copper on top, polyimide in the center and then the DLC on the bottom which then is protected by, uh, by, uh, by gluing it on a, on a PCB. We etch the copper, then we etch the, the polyimide uh, and in principle it should not touch the DLC, let's say we should just etch here. But what happens is when we, add, when we arrive at the, the DLC it starts to uh, to over etch and we also etch underneath here. Um, and when we remove the, the DLC, then actually uh, we see that we have two high holes over here. So um, 
with a little bit of trial and error, uh, our etching expert was able to reduce uh, this, this effect, to reduce, not to completely avoid it, but to reduce it. Uh, instead of holes of, uh, of more than 120 micron, we got holes of 80, where we wanted actually to have holes of 50 micron diameter. Uh, and this actually gives us somewhat better results in which theoretically we should be able to see the signals that we're actually, um, let's say, too much on the, on the edge to, to really work with this. And this is something we need to change in a more dramatic way to, to produce uh, the high quality holes for our detector that we need. So the idea that was actually developed in, in all this process uh, during uh, an, an project, uh, let's say, founded by, by NFN, is to uh, make a new kind of flexible copper clad laminates, FCCLs, which they are called, in which uh, we have DLC in black, both on top and on the bottom of the polyamide foil, and we cover this with uh, uh, copper, both on the top and on the bottom. Then, if we use the double mask proce procedure, we can make the photoresist search that we remove the copper where we want to create the holes. Uh, then we need a dedicated procedure here to remove the, the DLC, after which we can do the chemical etching of the, of the polyamide and we can obtain our holes. Then afterwards we remove the, the copper and we have a nice way of, of making our holes. Here, the copper acts actually as a protection of the DLC layer on top of the, of the DLC, which works much better than having it glued on, on, on a PCB. So this is a, an idea that has also been picked up by our uh, colleagues at the USTC University uh, in China, and actually they got also very interested in the production of uh, diamond-like carbon for uh, developing uh, detectors. Um, they also uh, made uh, deposition through magnetron sputtering of uh, uh, nitrogen-doped uh, DLC. However, they observed some uh, instability uh, over the order of several days, so where, where the pure DLC seemed to have a very uh, constant uh, surface resistivity as function of time. You see here that after a couple of days they, they uh, stabilize the, the resistivity. Uh, however, for the, the nitrogen doped, there are some processes that uh, they, that we did still do not understand, that actually make this uh, resistivity growing day by day. And this is something that has not yet been understood. Now, they also started working on, on double-sided DLC. Uh, uh, because this would reduce the uh, the uh, stress in in the in the foil because they noticed that when they put the DLC only on one top the the foil start to curve so they uh, they made an, um, a setup in their magnetron sputtering uh, device in which the foils are uh, rotating uh, such that the DLC is being deposited on both on both sides uh, and also there they they still observed some uh, some uh, non-uniformity of the of the surface resistivity, um, so they they are still working on this. They were thinking of uh, adding also boron to reduce the uh, internal stress of the, the DLC deposit created in this way. They also picked up the idea a set of depositing the the copper on top of the on top of the DLC, uh, and they did some first tests already. Um, where uh, they're doing some, some uh, stress tests to see the, uh, to understand the quality, and they, they observe that when they just deposit copper on top of the, of the DLC, uh, maybe it's a bit difficult to see, but here it delaminates very easily. So uh, the DLC does not attach very well to the, uh, to the copper, and, and you easily remove the copper from the top of the DLC. So they have been thinking of uh, changing the process in which they also use a uh, chromium layer, of um, smaller than, than a micrometer to make the copper attached to the, to the DLC. Uh, and this brings me to the diamond-like carbon that we would like to, to produce in, in, in Lecce. So uh, since um, Lecce has an, uh, an excellent uh, experience in, in uh, pulsed laser deposition, we would like to, to use this uh, deposition technique as an alternative to the, to the magnetron sputtering to better understand the quality of the DLC, to reduce the uh, internal stress of the DLC, uh, and to make some small size uh, samples. So uh, we created an, uh, an, an experiment in, 
and the fifth group of, uh, of ENFN to continue the R&D of the fast timing MPGD and to uh, uh, investigate the pulsed laser deposition of diamond-like carbon on polyimide, which we are uh, three uh, sections of ENFN, Bari, Lecce and Pavia. Uh, we got a funding of about 130 kilo euros for the next three years, uh, and we want to try to uh, reduce the production time of the polyimide with, uh, with a thin DLC coating and develop a procedure for which the DLC deposition has a reprodu reproducible uh, resistivity through the pulsed laser deposition. Uh, and we would like to have a uh, DLC with an increased strength and an increased adhesion to the, uh, to the polyamide file, which then we can finally use to demonstrate the fast timing principle because as long as we are not able to uh, produce the right structure in which we have the gas amplification, we cannot test our uh, detector prototypes. So, uh, the idea is to, to make very high quality thin DLC films through the pulsed laser deposition uh, and to do this in a reproducible way. So it's important that we can establish a recipe in which we have a good uh, thickness uniformity and a good adhesion of the DLC to the polyamide uh, and in which we can uh, uh, change the, the value of the resistivity nearly at will such that we can uh, uh, vary the resistivity such that we can have the, the right resistivity to have the trade-off of rate capability versus uh, the resistivity for our detector. The pulsed laser deposition is a, is a very versatile tool to make those DLC uh, films because you can and control all parameters nearly independently uh, and it will allow also for a fast iteration to, uh, uh, of, the, of the test to converge to uh, reproducible uh, results. Then uh, we need to characterize these uh, DLC films and we will use the atomic force uh, microscopy and uh, electron microscopy to study the morphology and the topography of the DLC uh, and to study the DLC and the polyamide bound and the internal stress through Raman spectroscopy and a four hull, uh, four point hull probe to, uh, to characterize the electrical uh, properties. The idea is to uh, create a deposit on a very small area. So this is, this is of the order of a couple of uh, square centimeters. So if we can make several of these foils uh, with an, uh, a DLC deposit on top, we can uh, send them to CERN to uh, to etch the, the polyimide with, with holes such that these become detector elements. If we then make a stack of several of those layers, we can put them together in a detector, and this is one of the things that we would like then to test with a uh, laser setup in, uh, in Bari before going to, to test beams. So what are these, the applications of these uh, detectors? So one of the applications we see in high energy physics where uh, for future colliders, for instance in CERN, they're right now in the process of thinking of an about 100 kilometer uh, circumference uh, uh, collider that should be constructed in the, the 2030s on in the Geneva area to, uh, to investigate the, the origin of, uh, of the Higgs boson and to understand the, uh, to, to investigate the, the potential of the, the Mexican hat uh, uh, Higgs potential, um, which we cannot do with the current machine of the LHC. So, there we have a much larger uh, ring, which allows to much higher uh, center of mass energies. Uh, these uh, accelerators will typically also work at uh, instantaneous luminosities of 10 times larger, for which we expect as many as 1,000 collisions uh, per 25 nanoseconds that will overlap. This is some, some tests we already did in CMS, which there are only 80 uh, overlapping collisions. It's already very difficult to... Uh, to pick the right collision, the interesting collision, let's say, uh, it will be much tougher when we have 1,000 overlapping collisions. And there you can actually uh, change the paradigm of the detectors if you also have uh, a fast timing component because right now the only disambiguation between the different uh, vertices is made based on um, detectors with spatial resolution. If instead these, the, these uh, collisions have a spread of about 100, 160 uh, uh, picoseconds, so you would be able, if you have an, uh, a time resolution of the order of uh, 30 picoseconds, you would be able to, to slice this picture into 30 different uh, slices, such that you reduce the number uh, of uh, overlapping collisions by, by a factor of 30, which uh, helps in uh, uh, disambiguating the, the collisions. 
another field of application where this fast timing uh, detector can, can be uh, implemented is the, the time of flight positron emission tomography. If we uh, can adapt the detector to be also sensitive to uh, 511 kilo electron volt uh, uh, electrons, that we can measure this with a uh, time resolution of of about 100 uh, picoseconds. These gases detectors are uh, rather cheap to instrument very large areas. And instead of having a small uh, circular ring of, um, of uh, the, the, let's say, the current state of the art uh, PET devices, we would be able to make a full body scanner, uh, which has a surface area of a, a few couple of uh, a few uh, square meters. So that said, I would like to, to thank all the uh, uh, people which would have uh, collaborated in the, in the past on, on, on this project, as well as uh, uh, the uh, Oki, Zhu, and uh, Gianni per, for the material that I used in, in, in this presentation. I would like to thank also, in particular, Antonio Ranieri and uh, Anna Paola for their uh, trust and endless uh, stimulation in this, uh, in this project. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, for a very interesting um, presentation and a huge amount of data. But before we move to questions, I would like to give the, the microphone to Gianni Bencivegni from uh, the National Laboratories in Frascati, who has a short presentation about uh, uh, the same topic. Please. Okay, first of all, uh, I have to say that uh, I didn't prepare a specialized uh, presentation for, uh, for this meeting because, okay, I had no time and uh, uh, Pete asked me to, to prepare something just a few hours ago, a few hours ago. So, uh, okay, I took one of the last presentation I did uh, uh, some months ago in a RD51 uh, uh, meeting. And uh, essentially, okay, I will report about uh, the um, R&D on microRL. The microRL is, uh, okay, how it works, uh, this one? Okay, yes. So, okay, this is the outline, okay. So the microRL is, um, is a micro pattern gaseous detector that, uh, uh, okay, yes, uh, that is sketched here. And uh, uh, here you can see uh, essentially is a, a Okay, it's a gaseous detector that is composed just by only two elements, the drift cathode, uh, some millimeters of gas that uh, is used for the conversion of the, 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 the uh, in order to create essentially the ionization uh, uh, for, for a part, uh, from, from a particle that passing through the, 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 the detector. And uh, essentially, the second component is, the, of course, the most important uh, one, is the, uh, what we call a micro well PCB. It's a PCB, essentially, that can be uh, realized on a rigid PCB readout, but also a flexible uh, uh, PCB. Uh, so essentially, the PCB readout uh, on, the, on this uh, component, uh, that essentially is, uh, is, uh, is uh, the core of the, of the detector, of the micro well, we have uh, the, the, the amplification stage that is practically realized, uh, uh, realized starting essentially from the same uh, base component used also uh, in FTM and in particular, all, uh, of course, uh, uh, in gem detector. So it's essentially is a polyamide, oops, sorry, is a polyamide, polyamide uh, uh, mat material. Uh, with the copper on the on the top and uh, a, a layer of uh, uh, resist a, a resistive layer that also in this case uh, is uh, realized uh, uh, with a diamond like carbon technology so this uh, foil this amplification stage single amplification stage is coupled through a, uh, an insulating film uh, to a practically to the to the readout pcb um, okay we studied, we started this, uh, this R&D uh, in 2014 
and uh, we uh, essentially we developed different kind, of different uh, different uh, de design of the of, of such a, such a detector. Here you can see uh, how it looks like the, the 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 amplification stage of the of the detector. So copper, polymide, DLC, and then the readout. All this uh, is coupled. Uh, with, uh, with a drift cathode and fill it with, uh, with uh, a suitable ga gas mixture. The application of, uh, of, uh, of such a detector is, okay, we are working for uh, ship experiment at CERN, we are proposing for uh, the circular electron positron collider in China. There are also some interest uh, in the um, uh, super, uh, super tau, char uh, tau charm factory in Novosibirsk the electron ion collider, and also in China. Again, uh, this is another uh, uh, Tau Charm factory in China. And uh, we are also developing this detector for an upgrade uh, of uh, the experiment uh, where I work, the LCB experiment for the muon upgrade. Uh, so, okay. Uh, I'm not expert of diamond-like carbon. I'm here. I, also to learn something and uh, probably to collaborate also with uh, with uh, uh, with um, uh, Anna Paula and uh, in the uh, and the researcher here in uh, in Lecce. In any case, okay, our uh, DLC is uh, practically realized by in collaboration with Asuiko uh, Ochi that works uh, in, in in the Atlas experiment, but uh, uh, that collaborate with us, uh, giving us ex essentially. The, 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 uh, pro providing us uh, uh, the foil uh, with, um, with the DLC deposition. And this is uh, done in a, in a, in a company, uh, this, uh, this company uh, in, in Japan. Uh, more, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, more recently, we are also uh, starting, uh, started a collaboration uh, with uh, ZUI uh, from uh, the USTC um, in Eifei in China. Uh, for the manufacturing of uh, what we call improved DLC, essentially foil, uh, fo uh, um, captain foil with the DLC deposition plus copper de deposition. And this is, uh, uh, I will show you uh, where, uh, why is uh, so in interesting uh, for us, uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of material. Uh, so, Okay, this is the, I just summarized the principle of operation of our detector, uh, but essentially, okay, uh, I, I don't want to go through all these details, but essentially it's quite similar to FTM and, and, and to a gem detector. You can see here, okay, uh, you have uh, the, uh, the, the ionization uh, uh, of, the, um, of the particle, of the charger particle is uh, collected inside the hole, where, uh, of course, uh, the hole is polarized uh, here with, uh, with an high voltage that is, uh, is applied between uh, the top uh, copper, uh, uh, mm, the top copper in the, in the amplification stage and the resistive stage. Uh, typically, okay, uh, the, 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 the high voltage depends on the, on the, on the, on the gas mixture that you are using uh, in, in your detector, but essentially it's around 500, 600 volt. Uh, and uh, here, of course, uh, you have uh, a very intense, uh, 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 very intense uh, um, um, electric field, uh, and then uh, you have a mu multiplication process of the uh, of the uh, primary and secondary uh, ionization in the gas, and then uh, you have uh, the the the, um, uh, the the charge is induced uh, on the on the on the resistive foil, and uh, is uh, uh, then uh, is uh, 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 th mm, th there is a capacitive coupling between the resistive stage and the readout. I just remind you, the readout is uh, just uh, on the bottom side of the of the of the amplification stage. Then uh, you have uh, the the signal is uh, is induced is capacitively induced uh, on the on your PCB that can be. Uh, patterned uh, as a pad, a pixel, or a strip readout. Of course, uh, the introduction, the main effect of the introduction of the resistive stage is the suppression of the transition from streamer to spark. So, uh, it's one of the motivation for which we, uh, we, we were uh, looking for uh, such a kind of detector uh, that we developed together with Rui, the, the Oliveira at CERN. 
and uh, just looking for uh, spark suppression because uh, the spark, uh, the, the spark, the discharge is one of the, uh, let's say, one of the most common problem uh, issue in the micro pattern gas detector. And so, the introduction of the of the of the resistive stage help in the suppression of the transition from streamer to spark, just uh, reducing the amplitude of the of the discharge. Of course, uh, there are some drawbacks. Uh, drawbacks is the capability to stand high particle fluxes uh, and so on. But of course, uh, also here you can do something, and I, uh, uh, I will show uh, you some uh, some results and some some idea and some results uh, that we obtain. Of course, uh, if you take uh, a non-resistive detector like a gem detector uh, that we built also together with, uh, with Antonio, okay, they are building also for CMS, but we built uh, at the very beginning for LCB and then also for, uh, uh, for a CLO experiment. Uh, of course, a non-resistive detector has a rate capability, so essentially the, uh, the capability to stand a very high flux of uh, charged particle particles uh, that uh, could arrive to something like uh, 50 megahertz per square centimeter. Of course, in this case, when you introduce uh, the resistive stage, of course, uh, the rate capability goes down. But I, I will show you some, uh, some, some results. This is the, let's say, uh, very, very uh, schematic uh, view of what we call uh, the single resistive layer with edge grounding. Here, okay, I don't put uh, the, 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 the grounding, uh, but okay. Uh, so you start with, uh, with, um, with a base material that is essentially capped on layer of 50 micron polymide. So the same material I used for FTM, the same material used for uh, uh, gem detector, apart from the fact that uh, you have copper only on one side and the LC on the other side. So essentially, we send uh, this foil, this, uh, this uh, polymide foil, uh, it's sent uh, to, in this case, in Japan, and uh, where uh, they make, uh, they, they, they do essentially the, 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 the position uh, through, uh, on, uh, of, of, uh, of a DLC layer. Okay, here I put some uh, resistivity, but okay, I will go, um, uh, after I will, I will explain, I will give uh, some more details about that. Then uh, this part of the detect, uh, this, uh, this base material is uh, coupled through an insulating medium, uh, mi medium to, uh, directly to the PCB readout, that is, uh, uh, you can imagine here, you can have a strip, uh, pad, uh, pixel, something like that. Then, after all this, uh, you take uh, this, this object, and you send, typically, at CERN, but not only at CERN, because we are also doing some uh, technology transfer to industry, uh, you send this for the, uh, to CERN, for example, to Rui, for the etching, for the final etching of the polymide, in order to create the pattern of the hole that will be the, well, um, the amplification stage of the detector. This is the most uh, simple layout that you can imagine. The, of course, the, uh, the DLC is grounded all around. This is a cross-section of the detector. Uh, uh, you have to imagine a, a grounding uh, here so somewhere. Uh, here you put uh, the high voltage, and here you put uh, the ground of the detector. So, <laughs> okay, we obtain some results. Uh, okay, I don't want to bore you with these uh, results. Okay, uh, the detector can be operated with different gas mixture. You can see here that these are uh, gain curves uh, with different uh, gas mixture. We can obtain essentially something like uh, 10 to the 4, a gain of 10 to the 4. Uh, we uh, obtain also gain larger than 10 to the 4, about uh, 7, 8, uh, 10 to the 4, uh, but in some special conditions. Okay, this is one of the problem uh, that generally uh, uh, you have to cope with uh, when uh, you are working with a single stage uh, micro pattern gas detector. But okay, uh, so the gain is not so high, but it's uh, enough high. I am quite uh, surprised that you, because uh, the problem is that uh, with FTM uh, you are looking for very high uh, gain. So this is, uh, of course, is a, is a very challenging. Um, so, okay. Uh, Probably this one has been showed also by, by uh, Pete. Uh, essentially, at the very beginning, we tried to study and to understand uh, which was uh, the best uh, uh, surface resistivity of DLC. And okay, we have found uh, that, for example, also for uh, 
concerning the space resolution, uh, you have uh, this kind of uh, behavior, okay, I don't want to go through these details, but essentially uh, we stabilize uh, at the very beginning, uh, we try with uh, very low resistivities, very high resistivity, and then uh, uh, now all the, this is a very old uh, uh, plot and uh, measurement that we have done at the very beginning. So the uh, space resolution, uh, as a minimum around, uh, let's say, uh, 100 uh, mega per square, and more or less we are working there. Uh, so uh, we also did some special measurement uh, using our detector in micro TPC mode, but this is a very particular uh, application, just uh, to show that, okay, we can obtain also space resolution uh, that are very, very good, uh, between 40 and, sec and 60 micron, uh, but um, for uh, uh, tracks that, oops, for, for tracks uh, with different uh, incident angle with respect to the, uh, uh, your detector, respect to the detector. So, okay, um, uh, I was uh, mentioning that we are also doing something uh, in the direction of uh, the technology transfer to industry. And this is, uh, okay, uh, um, we, try, we, are in, we are in contact with different uh, uh, company. Uh, this Eltos, uh, the Eltos is, a, is, a, is a, um, essentially is a, is a, is a uh, firm that works uh, the, um, near, closer to, to, to Arezzo in Italy. And uh, here uh, in, in Arezzo, we essentially do the first part of the uh, of the manufacturing process uh, is done there in, uh, in, in Eltos. And, and uh, uh, here you can see four uh, de detectors. Essentially in Eltos what we, uh, we do generally, they, they are able, uh, they uh, are under the, 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 the manufacturing process uh, at the moment is practically under control and, uh, and uh, they are able uh, to create, uh, this is uh, the standard PCB that they produce of course, uh, because okay, they generally produce uh, uh, rigid uh, PCB, and then uh, they couple the here. This uh, this um, this foil uh, is essentially the foil, the basic foil of uh, polyimide with the copper on one side and uh, uh, and the DLC on the other side. Then uh, this uh, object uh, will uh, is uh, then uh, is sent to CERN for the for the um, uh, for the etching. Uh, of the polymide and uh, uh, in order to create the pattern of the amplification stage. So now practically the, the Eltos uh, okay, uh, has a practically 100% of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of efficiency in doing this, uh, this manufacturing step. We also did, oh sorry, this uh, which is the size here, the active area is about uh, uh, 10 by 10 square centimeter. Okay. So, but we did uh, more than this because uh, always, uh, 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 yes, in, uh, in Eltos, yes, also in Eltos, we did uh, some exercise in the form or, or, uh, of a collaboration with CMS for, the, for a possible upgrade uh, uh, option uh, 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 based on micro well. Uh, on micro well uh, detector for uh, for the upgrade uh, for the upgrade uh, of the CMS uh, muon apparatus, uh, uh, we also did in Eltos uh, two kind of exercise. One, the first one was uh, to build uh, a 1.2 times 0.5 square meter of detector with DLC, <laughs> and uh, the second exercise was uh, to do this large uh, detector, but of course we did, uh, of course, uh, uh, since uh, the Capton foil, uh, the maximum size of the Capton foil is uh, 60 centimeter times uh, what you want, more or less. But uh, the limitation, uh, the, uh, the limitation uh, in, uh, in the Kobe uh, industry is that they are able uh, maximum uh, to uh, make, uh, to do the, to, to perform a spattering, uh, a DLC spattering on a foil on a six foil, uh, if I remember well, eh? six foil at the same time of this size. So what this was uh, practically, the, the, the is practically the maximum size uh, that we are doing. Uh, we are uh, able uh, to, to, to do and, uh, and is the maximum size uh, for, for our detector. 
For this kind of detector, the idea is different. It was essentially to reach uh, uh, this very big detector, uh, is about uh, two meter times uh, 1.2 meters, uh, made uh, essentially you produce a tile of detector that is more or less 600 by 500, more or less, and you glue, this is uh, practically the, 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 the basic tile of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, larger detector, and you, put, uh, you glue this, uh, this tile in order to realize uh, uh, a very, very large de detector. What I want to say with this, that, okay, of course, uh, starting from uh, the a product that uh, Japan is able to give us, we are able to build uh, such a large uh, area uh, de detector. But of course, uh, uh, we need uh, probably to do a step uh, behind because uh, we have to understand something more. I will show you. So this is the, the problem. Because uh, this problem is that uh, uh, up to now, I'm speaking about, uh, I was speaking about uh, the single resistive layer. So when uh, you build a so large uh, area, something like 600 by 500 millimeter detector with the uh, edge grounding, so practically the, the ground of the resistive layer is done all around the, the, um, uh, the perimeter of the detector. Of course, uh, this kind of detector is not able uh, to stand a very high particle fluxes. So the problem is that if you are uh, building uh, this kind of detector for uh, low rate application or relatively low rate applications, you can do, uh, you can use uh, this very simple, uh, this very simple uh, scheme, the single resistive, what we call a single resistive layer. But, uh, sorry, if you need to go at high rate, you have to think something else. So, and the idea is the following, more or less. So if here you have a 50 by 50 square centimeter detector, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, uh, since the detector is a resistive detector, you have a drop. And you have also a non-uniform, if the grounding is, is done all around the detector, this is the surface of the DLC, and you have to imagine on the top of this, uh, the amplification stage, of course, what happens? Uh, uh, that, of course, if, the, if you have... Uh, um, a particle that uh, 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 is incident, incident in, the, in the center or, or in, uh, at the edge, of course, uh, the resistance seen by uh, the, the particle is different, by the current generated by the particle is, uh, is different. And then uh, the, the, this detector can uh, work uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good, uh, in, um, can work. Uh, uh, with, uh, without, uh, in, a, in a uniform way, only at very low uh, particle rate. So what you have uh, to, to think, you have to think to, uh, to, uh, to make a sort of segmentation of this, uh, of this uh, large area. For example, this was the first idea that we, uh, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, developed with, uh, always with Rui, and uh, the idea was uh, to build uh, two different layer not only one single layer, but a double layer, and the double layer are connected one to each other with true bias, uh, with, uh, with some connection that goes, uh, in a, in, um, uh, that goes from, from the first layer to the second layer, every, for example, every centimeter. In this way, practically, okay, I don't want to go through this blah, 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 but essentially, if you compare these two detectors, uh, you, here you gain, uh, and assuming that the resistivity is practically the same, you gain a rate capability of about 20 times better than this. So 20 times is not so bad. So let's go ahead. And so uh, this is what we call the double resistive layer. Here you have the, the, the bias, so the amplification stage, the first DLC layer. Then again, a, a Capton layer with a second resistive layer always done in, with DLC. You have a, a, a conductive bias that connect the two. Uh, this is a cross section, of course, of the detector um, uh, that connect the two DLC layers. And then the second layer is connected, is grounded, let's say, through the uh, readout electrodes. So, okay, this works, but it's too complex. 
uh, it's not easy to industrialize, you know, it's not easy to, to um, uh, for uh, it's not easy to transfer uh, uh, to the uh, to to the standard industry because uh, okay this is uh, was done was performed by Rui but uh, is practically an artwork so it works but uh, we would like to find uh, something uh, different uh, some uh, more simple and uh, the idea I go I don't want to bore you about uh, all the, uh, the, the, the the this. Uh, scheme uh, but essentially we came back uh, to the single layer so this um, okay this drawing is not is not done in a, in a very good way but okay uh, the, the, the idea is the following you have always uh, the um, the amplification stage then you have the DLC the DLC uh, on the bottom of the DLC you have uh, some uh, strip lines copper strip lines or uh, in the very begin at the very beginning uh, we had uh, silver grid lines that uh, goes uh, along uh, the, okay it's, it's like this uh, for, for example you so this is, these are the lines uh, no okay that are uh, grounded at a certain in in a, in a certain point uh, externally uh, on the detector so uh, is uh, always a surface grounding but uh, with uh, uh, with uh, these uh, grounding lines that are realized on the on the on the DLC, okay. We did uh, a certain number of these. We study uh, okay. We try to optimize uh, the geometry, and essentially this, uh, for example, is uh, a result that we obtained uh, during the last uh, beam test. Of course, it depends on the geometry, but you can see. Okay, the, um, uh, the SG1 is the first one. The efficiency, the here we, we report the efficiency of the detector. Of course, uh, if you uh, build uh, these, uh, uh, these grid lines uh, on the bottom of the resistive uh, DLC, uh, you need also to, to put, uh, to, to, in, uh, to introduce a, a small dead zone. That in any case, uh, you, you see, uh, uh, of course, uh, the efficiency goes down. So the efficiency that we can obtain with the, with the first prototype was uh, about 76%. Then, uh, okay, we have, you have to go to the black one is the second more optimized detector of this kind of uh, what we call a grid, um, uh, single resistive layer, but with uh, grid lines. Uh, the black one uh, we obtain 94% and then uh, the last one is the red one uh, we obtain 97%. We compare this uh, family of uh, let's say silver grid okay we call uh, uh, single layer silver grid uh, de de detector uh, we uh, compare the, these detectors with the uh, with the double layer detector uh, that is taken as a reference. Of course, in that case, uh, you don't have any dead zone, and the efficiency of the detector is about 98%. So practically, you can optimize uh, this uh, scheme, and you can uh, arrive, uh, achieve uh, a, good, uh, a good result in terms of efficiency. What about uh, the rate capability? So this is, a very, this is the first time that uh, we show uh, uh, outside our lab uh, this, uh, this result. Sorry for the colors, uh, okay, uh, chosen by our uh, our student uh, that was not uh, the best one but in any case uh, okay you can see that uh, all these uh, uh, detector can achieve a flux uh, that is uh, let's say better than one megahertz per square centimeter our goal is uh, to stay around uh, two or three megahertz per square centimeter so okay we are there we obtain this uh, this uh, good result and, uh, and then, okay, we are quite, uh, uh, quite uh, satisfied. This is just uh, for comparison, is uh, a low rate, uh, the green one uh, is uh, one of the SG, uh, one of the high rate version, and the other two are, is a low rate version, so without a grid on the, on the bottom. So you can see, of course, uh, they, the performance are not uh, uh, at the same level, but okay. So, one important point, of course, uh, for uh, our detector is also to study the aging of the DLC, because uh, the other component of the detector are practically uh, tested 
uh, because uh, okay, uh, the gem detector, uh, the, 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 other, the other components are practically are the same I used for gem detector. And gem detector, we studied, uh, okay, not only our group, but many other groups uh, study the, the, the behavior of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, gem detector uh, under irradiation. But uh, we, of course, uh, it's important to study what happens to the DLC. Uh, and so, okay, we started uh, some tests uh, more or less one year ago uh, with uh, two different uh, detectors, two different uh, micro well. Here is a period in which uh, there, there were not uh, irradiation, but essentially what we have demonstrated is that, okay, the detector was able to, we, uh, the, the, the high rate uh, detector, for example, uh, achieve something like uh, 200 millicoulomb per square centimeter. That is not so much. But in any case, uh, we can say that at least uh, up to uh, 200, 300 uh, millicoulomb per square centimeter, the, the DLC is uh, stable. Of course, uh, the test must be, uh, must be uh, continued on, on the next year. Okay, here are some other results. But we are, of course, we, have, um, uh, we are starting also a collaboration with the USTC, Kobe, and CERN, uh, our group in Frascati is uh, working with, uh, with all these uh, uh, institutions in order to define a reliable uh, manufacturing process to deposit uh, DLC plus copper on, uh, on uh, apical foils. Uh, essentially, the, uh, the, this work is done by these two groups in Kobe and, uh, and in China, in Japan and in China. Uh, we, of course, have to study um, uh, the stability of DLC uh, under uh, irradiation and uh, for the, because, of course, it's, uh, it's quite important that uh, this detector should survive, must survive uh, 10 years after, 10 years, something like that, uh, several years under irradiation. We have, of course, to, to do some uh, long-term tests uh, and, uh, okay, we are organizing all this work. Uh, okay, here just the summary. Okay, our detect we measure a lot of things with our detector. It's important to say that we are uh, we uh, we are working uh, is uh, about a couple of years that we are working in, in technology the technology transfer to industry uh, in in Eltos. Uh, I forgot to mention also that we are started also in uh, the the etching in the Tectra, the etching of the polymide in Tectra, and uh, we re we receive a good. Uh, they are obtaining a very good uh, preliminary result. Okay, of, of course, it takes uh, at least another year uh, to stabilize all the process and so on. For the high rate, uh, we are um, we studied several lay uh, layouts uh, that are seems uh, to okay to give us uh, what we are looking for. Uh, uh, very good results at level of megahertz. Of course, we, it's not easy to, to, to achieve uh, rate capability, uh, let's say, at level of 10 megahertz or more, uh, but it's enough for our purposes. And uh, of course, we are, it's uh, quite important uh, to study, um, to understand better DLC. Uh, the different, uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's important also to study different uh, man manufacturing processes and uh, to study, of course, uh, the stability under irradiation. So, thanks a lot.